Um, back to Mark 8 here. We did take a break last week to kind of talk about 2 Corinthians, but this week we are back in the King and a Kingdom series. And let me just give a quick overview of some of the things we've seen, which have been great. I mean, think about the calling and clarification of who Jesus is we saw early in Mark with really his baptism where God himself spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. Um, just the calling of Jesus and who he was. The calling of the disciples, as unique as they were. We spent one Sunday talking about the disciples and who they were. The casting out of demons and the healing of sick people as a sign and confirmation of who Jesus is. The teachings of the coming king and the kingdom that he's establishing. The fights with the Pharisees that we've seen throughout Mark 1 through 8. And the connection is the story of the Exodus. When Jesus comes and kind of creates a new Exodus for his people, um, and Mark helps us understand the greater significance of things that are going on that have further ramifications than just the current scene of what's happening in Jesus' day, but all the way back to the Old Testament and the things that have happened in Exodus. If you don't believe me, there's a great book by a man named Ricky Watts who writes about Isaiah's new Exodus in Mark, and he talks about the Exodus in the book of Mark. It's absolutely brilliant. It's a bit nerdy, so if you're a nerd like me, you'd enjoy it. It's a great book. But most recently, we saw how Jesus walked on water, how he fed the hungry crowds, and he's starting in his series on discipleship. What does it mean to be a disciple? And in fact, today we're going to get to the turning point in the Gospel of Mark, in Mark chapter 8, where Jesus will now be on the way to Jerusalem. In fact, you'll see this phrase over and over used in Mark 8 and following. He's on the way, the Greek word hodos, which means the way, literally the road. He's on his way to Jerusalem, and he doesn't want to turn back to the things that he was doing before, but he's going to do more intense teachings now. There's not going to be any more miracles. There's not going to be any more healings or casting outs of demons, but he's now on the way to Jerusalem to take care of the task that God has set before him. And Mark is starting to hone in on the precise reason that he would go to Jerusalem to die, to be crucified, and to resurrect unto new life, to give us life, which is very cool. So if you can picture in your mind that we're about partway through the movie, about halfway, and you don't want to get up to use the bathroom yet because the good stuff is coming, right? You don't want to, you don't want to take a break from this. Read the rest of Mark because it's compelling, and the picture of what Jesus is going to do is really compelling from Mark 8 to 16. Let me introduce our passage today by asking you a question. Do you ever have one of those moments when you're talking to someone and you realize that that person is not actually saying what they're saying? Or, or they're asking a question, but it's the question behind the question that really is the most important thing. And you maybe realize it about halfway through. They're not actually saying that. They're saying something else. They're not actually asking me that question. They're asking me something else. Think of some examples with me. My, what if my wife comes up to me and says, hey, it's garbage day tomorrow. What is she actually saying? Take out the garbage, right? Like, she didn't say take out the garbage, but, but it's garbage day tomorrow means take out the garbage. She didn't say what she meant. Think if your boss says to you, can I see you in my office about an hour? Like, that's usually kind of bad news. You're like thinking about what's going to happen over the next hour, right? Or what if I say to my daughter, is there a reason why your room is so dirty? That's really not a question, is it? That's like a statement. Would you please clean your room? Or maybe you're in here and you have a girlfriend or boyfriend and you have the conversation with them one night and you say, well, it's not really you, it's me. What does that mean? It's you, right? We know it's you is the truth of the matter. Many times there are questions and comments behind the comments and questions that we have. Comments behind these things. And I think Jesus does this today in Mark chapter 8. Not in a passive aggressive way, which can happen sometimes, but in a way to get to the heart of the matter. And it really shows up in one verse, and that is in Mark 8, 27. And I'll read this to you. The words will be behind us on the screens, or you can follow along with me in your Bible. Let's see what Jesus says today in this. Let's it's a question here. It says, And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, there's that phrase I told you about, on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say I am? Who do people say I am? There's the question. It's not necessarily the question, but it's the question behind the question that I think that Jesus is getting to. Because here's the reason. Don't you think he knows what people are saying about him already? I mean, there's no mystery in the book of Mark. Everyone's falling and the crowds are showing up like mad. It's been one of the major themes of Mark 1 through 8 is the crowds and the disciples and everyone who's following him. He knows what's happening, but he takes a moment and he says to the disciples, hey, who do people say that I am? It's not like he's wondering. It's not like he has his head in the clouds or something. He knew what people were saying, but it's the question behind the question that Jesus was getting to this morning. 
Now, for some background, you have to note that this question occurred in the unlikely location of Caesarea Philippi, which lay on the border between the Holy Land and Gentile territory and was famed for its religious and philosophical progress in the ancient world. The people were not just trying to get by and building their city. Rather, they were a modern city with lots going for it. Herod the Great, also known as the King of Judea or the King of the Jews, was one who killed all the babies before Jesus was born. He was a man who came through. He built a grand marble temple there to celebrate human progress, not just any gods or anything like that, but rather human progress. And his son Herod Philip enlarged the city and renamed it in honor of himself. Pretty amazing, huh? Human progress and all the things that are going on in this city. And Jesus is walking him on. Maybe he sees the temple that's being built, the marble temple. Maybe he sees the progress that's going on in the city and he just takes a minute and says to the disciples, who do people say that I am? Who do, who do you say I am today? Kelly and I went to Victoria a couple weekends ago, which is an amazing city. I don't know if you've been up there before. We got a chance to take the ferry out of Port Angeles. We walked on and packed our backpacks and cruised up there and stayed for a couple nights for our 16th wedding anniversary. It's an amazing city to wander around. You can walk pretty much everywhere there. It's just a joy. You have to turn off your phones if you're cheap like me and don't want to spend international charges. And so you feel like you're somewhere else, totally disconnected from the world. And so we just got to spend some time there. And on our last day there, we decided to tour some of the churches that were in Victoria. There are some old buildings in Victoria. And one of the places we went was a, was a beautiful church here. You can kind of see the inside of it here that was built years in the 1800s. Beautiful stained glass windows, um, beautiful marble kind of towering kind of vaulted ceilings and things like that. There was just amazing things going for it there. The pews were older than you can imagine. There was kind of a smell like all old Baptist churches have. You know what I'm talking about there? You kind of smell it in there as well. And I, I, I wandered around there and I thought, this place is just amazing. But it was funny because it kind of grieved me a little bit as I walked through there. And I wandered through and and the reason why was not because the building was beautiful or anything like that or, or not because I thought it was a waste of resources or anything like that, but rather as you wandered through, almost everything that was there was dedicated to some person rather than Jesus. Almost everything that was there was kind of an immemorial to this person who donated this amount of money so we could do this. And then, and then what they were doing here on a regular basis now was not necessarily having church services, which is their most important thing, but rather they having concerts there. And so it was funny, as you wandered through the old things, you can kind of see on the sides there, they had these modern, beautiful Bose speakers hanging up in the church here, just blasting beautiful music, I'm sure when they have the concert series and stuff that's going on there. But I sat there for a minute, we wandered the whole thing, and I said to Kelly, I I'm kind of sad by this building. I I don't know why. I I just feel sad. Because I think the reason why is because... Now, granted, let me back up just a little bit and say, I I think this building started off with some beauty and great intentions. I think they built it with the purpose of making much of Jesus. But at some place along the way, it started to drift. And it started to drift into becoming more about the people who were showing up than the God, Jesus, who they were worshiping. And I just sat there in the pew and I went, man, we just, we got to go. I can't be here anymore. I, I got to go back to the church and the truck driving school, all right? That's what I feel like I should go to. Not because I, it wasn't beautiful or not because it wasn't ornate and the organ was the most amazing thing ever, but rather because I think it turned into a place where people forgot who Jesus was. They forgot to make much of him. I think in some ways the question would be pointing to a church like this. Who do people say that I am? See, the question behind the question is what's most important here. It's not the building. It's not the facade. It's not the thing itself. It's rather the heart behind it that's most important. The building should have been screaming, it's all about Jesus. Every piece of it. It should have been a monument to proclaim who Jesus is was. Now again, I want to be fair. I I imagine it probably started out like that at some point. Maybe it drifted, and I don't know everyone there. I just know what I observed when I wandered through the place, and I think that this question becomes poignant for these people as well, because this question, which is the question behind the question as well, will affect all of your life. It'll affect everything you do. It'll affect the things that you build. It'll affect your job. It'll affect your family, your, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your kids. That question is, who do you say I am? And I think the belief behind this question, the implications of it, should influence every decision you ever make from here until your death. Let me read the rest of this story to see what the disciples say about this, because I think it's important for us to grasp what Jesus says here. Let's read from verse, let's just read it all again, from verse 27 and following. Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi, On the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. Others say, uh, Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. 
And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he, being Jesus, strictly charged them to tell no one about him. See, the disciples decide to answer this question, and they report maybe what is the first Gallup poll that's ever been given. You know, they say, you know, 17% say you're John the Baptist. 15% say you're Elijah. You know, you got 7% saying one of the prophets. It's amazing. All this great stuff. But we find that the man on the street has a great opinion about who Jesus is. And the people's views really offset all of the crowds and the crisis with the Pharisees and things because people see him as a good person. And so they say most view you as some sort of prophet figure, maybe even John the Baptist, which is really strange because if you think about it, he had just passed away. And so it's a little unique to even say those words. Or Elijah. These opinions remind the reader of Herod himself when he speculates that he was John the Baptist, Elijah, or one of the prophets back in Mark 6, 14 through 15. But Jesus is like, wait, you don't really get it. You don't really get the thing I'm aiming at here. Who do you say I am? I'm not looking to see how I'm ranked among the polls of the people. I'm not asking for the word on the street. I'm asking for something else. I'm looking for what your heart says about me, and I need to know that. Do you know that in Mark so far? The disciples have only called him teacher up to this point in Mark. They've used those words to describe who Jesus is. And this confession from Peter becomes a turning point in the gospel. Because here, Peter finally says, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah. And he has words about Jesus that actually proclaims who he is. And his confession occurs at the very center of the gospel of Mark. You are the Christ. And this passage serves as the hinge between the first part and the second part. Because as soon as the words come out, You are the Messiah. You are the Christ. Jesus is on his way to do the mission that God has called him to do. This confession even represents a significant leap of faith, given kind of the current expectations of a Messiah figure around that time of day. I mean, they expected from the Old Testament that a Messiah figure would show up and would conquer and would would overthrow the Romans who are in town, who are trying to oppress them in so many ways. They were thinking kind of Old Testament stuff, like we're going to be set free, we're going to have our own land, our own place, everyone's going to get away from us, and we are going to be set free to live as one people in one rule, is what they were expecting. And And here's Jesus who kind of shows up on the scene. He starts doing some amazing things like casting demons out and healing people, which is pretty amazing. But here is the significant change because as soon as Peter says these words, he's starting to understand something about Jesus. And that is that Jesus didn't show up just to overthrow the military things that were going on in Palestine, but rather he came for a different purpose, a purpose that's so important for the people to understand. And here he finally starts to get it. Peter finally starts to get these words. The Christ in Greek and Messiah in Hebrew and Aramaic mean the anointed one. The one who carries this sense of consecration for a particular task that God has for him. And it was used of kings and priests in the Old Testament. And here, Peter says those words. You're anointed. Lord, you're the one who's set apart to do the task that you have before you. I don't know what that is. Maybe Peter's thinking to himself, but here he has a divine inspired moment where he says, yes, you are the Messiah and I want to follow you. I wonder what you say about Jesus today. I wonder what your answer would be to that question. Not the popular opinions, the polls, the things like that. Not the things that you've been taught in Sunday school. Not the things that have been passed down from generation to generation, maybe from the church that you attended as a child, or the church like we saw in Victoria. But literally, the question behind the question for you today is, who do you say Jesus is? When it comes down to a deep in the heart thing, Not just the church answer, but rather who do you say he is personally to you? Are you more like the wandering crowds? You just kind of see him and follow him because he's a miracle worker and does amazing things. And you can see the benefits of following him because he heals those people around him. And maybe you'll get a piece of that too at some point along the way. Or rather, are you a person who, like Peter, takes a moment and says, man, you're you're the Lord. You're the Messiah. You're the anointed one set apart for a task, that task to to go to Jerusalem, to to be crucified on a cross, to die, to resurrect unto new life, so that I might have that as well. So that I might trade my sadness, my sickness, my brokenness for you, and you might replace that with me, with that, with the brokenness of my life, with the life that you can give to me. Many years ago, C.S. Lewis was famous for talking about Jesus in his book, Mere Christianity, 
which I'm going to refer to a couple times today because I don't think you can get much more classic than some of the views that he has on this question, who do you say I am? He said there's three options for a person who believes in Jesus or who knows who Jesus is. And he says he's either the Lord, he's a liar, or a lunatic. You've probably heard these things before. It's pretty famous and it's been said many times. The idea behind this is if we take Jesus' words and actions seriously, then we must, Je- must take Jesus' claims about himself seriously as well. We can't say that Jesus was a great teacher whom we admire and not look up to and that he wasn't really God. So he's either a liar and wants to deceive people or he's a lunatic who himself is deceived or he really is the Lord, and he was who he said he was. Those are the options that C.S. Lewis gave us. I think it's a super helpful distinction for us, and it's served us well for years. I think it's a great thing for us to wrestle with. But I want to take a different angle on it today. I want to take an angle on it and place that before you and say, what do you believe about Jesus? But here at Imprint Church, we do something every Sunday that's most important to us, and that is we have a response time. In fact, at the end of my message here in a few minutes, we'll give you a chance to respond once again, where you get a chance to worship, you get a chance to receive communion, you get a chance to give, you get a chance to pray. And it's based on this question, who do you say I am? Because see, for me, our belief of who Jesus is will affect how we respond to him. That's the most important thing. Not necessarily whether he's Lord, liar, lunatic, but your belief about who you say he is will affect how you respond to him. Not just here, but as you go out in the world, as you work 40, 50 hours a week, as you live in your families, your response to Jesus each and every day is most important in my mind. It's important. The question behind the question is not just who do you say I am, am I Lord, liar, and lunatic, but rather what are you going to do with that information? Because see, it's easy to just say, oh yeah, I, I believe Jesus. He's the Son of God. I, I, I know him. I've, I've read my Bible. I, I've studied it. I know some of the, the things that I've sat through in church for the years, and I know those things. But rather, what's most important is not just knowing those things, but actually responding to him. That's what I am most concerned with today. Because there's several options for how you view him. Again, if you see him as a mere man, you can reject everything he says, just as someone else would say not allow his actions and words to affect your hearts or your minds at all. If you see Jesus just as a philosopher, a religious philosopher, we can put his teachings on the level of other philosophers and we can take it or leave it. Okay, whatever, he's a great teacher. Just like the teachings of Buddha, just like the teachings of some of the modern psychology, pop psychology movement, we can throw all of those in the same category, take what we want to and live a good moral life because of those things. But rather, if he really is who he says he is, we respond to him in our hearts and we say, I let everything he says affect me every day. That's intense if you think about it. Those are intense words for us. Your response to this question, if Jesus is who he says he is, our response really should be to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. In fact, we see that in the rest of this passage. See, because Jesus actually amps it up for the disciples here. He doesn't leave them with just answering the question, because I think you can do that right now. You can have the good church answer. It's like every answer in church is Jesus, right? It's like, what is that back there? It looks like a door, but I'm going to say Jesus because I'm in church, right? Everything is the answer is Jesus, but rather, what's your response to who Jesus is? Let's see what Jesus says to them after they actually say the right words. After Peter says the right words, commands them not to say anything about it, let's see what Jesus says about this, about responding to him in verse 31 and following. So he, Jesus, began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And he called to to him the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with 
the holy angels. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Jesus' words here amp it up, don't they? Did you catch what he was saying? It's not just enough to know who Jesus is, but what are you going to do about it? What are you gonna, what's the next step you're going to take in knowing that I am the Messiah, I am the Lord? I find one of the most interesting things here when Peter comes up to him after this and says, no, no, Lord, you don't want to do that. You don't want to go to Jerusalem. You don't want to be on the way to Jerusalem. Stop doing that. The Bible is really interesting because it says, and he turned around. You know, he's on the way to Jerusalem. Everything is on the way. And here Peter distracts him and Jesus turns around to him and goes back to him. Mark's not wasting words here. There's something important about that. Jesus has a mission to accomplish here and you're getting in the way, Peter. Don't get in the way of the mission that I have to accomplish. In fact, he says, what are you going to do with these words that I say? You can't just live in the knowledge of who I am. You actually have to do something about it. It seems like Peter got it until we read the rest of the passage. Jesus doesn't really confirm his confession or anything like that. In fact, the Bible says he rebukes him twice. If you see it in Greek, the same word is in 830, or it appears in 832 through 33. That word rebuke. So Peter's getting a little bit of lesson from the master here. It's not just enough to say the words. It's not just enough to have the the right Sunday school answer, but rather, how are you going to respond to it? What are you going to do because of it? This is the question I placed before you today. It's almost easy. It's almost like I was telling Tom this week as I texted him, it's almost like the sermon was put on a tee this week and I can just hit it out of the park because Jesus asked it himself. What are you going to do with the question, who do you say I am? Your response is most important. After rebuking Peter, Jesus explains that it's necessary for the Son of Man to suffer and he tells them this plainly or boldly is what we see and he plunges them into the days. Moreover, Jesus' words here challenge Peter and the disciples to become his disciple as well. In other words, the question behind the question, the comment behind the question Jesus has is not necessarily just who do you say I am, but rather, will you be my disciple? Will you do that? If you know this is true, what are you going to do because of that? That's discipleship. Peter's concept of the Christ here is too narrow. He thinks that Christ will establish a reign of peace and righteousness, overthrow the power of of the oppressors who hold Israel in their grasp. The Christ is by definition a winner, destined for glory. But here Peter shows that there's a cross purpose with Jesus, that Jesus has something else he's going to do in being the Messiah, in being the anointed one, that he's going to, he told them plainly, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, that I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, I'm going to be crucified there. And he tells them this, and Peter's like, no, 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 that's, I, we don't want to go there, Lord, we don't want to go there. Little does Peter know that that very thing that's going to happen is going to save his life. Again, let me allow, allow me to remind you of this. The point of all of this is that your view of Jesus is how you will respond to him. Your view of what he does, what he goes to, the Jerusalem story of him walking from here to Jerusalem to be crucified that we're going to study in a few weeks here will affect how you respond to him today and every day. There's three things that Jesus says, three demands Jesus' discipleship 101 class really here that he gives to the disciples. He says, there's three things that I want you to do if you, if you really are going to follow me and be my disciple, if you're really going to understand the question behind this. And here's the first thing. He says, you're going to deny yourself. The second thing he says, I'm going to take up your cross. And the third thing is that you're going to follow me, is what he says. In other words, we get this idea that a disciple must do more than simply understand who Jesus is. It's only the first step in following Jesus along the way. We must do more than understanding who he is. And here they are. It's the picture of what life is as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And this is where it gets amped up a little bit for us as people. Because we don't like the idea of even denying ourselves. We must be careful not to confuse the call of of self-denial with the kind of devout asceticism in some way, like that we might be holier than thou in some way, shape, or form, but rather this idea of denying yourself is the idea of dying to your own wishes and desires. That you have someone else who's giving you those wishes and desires now, and we need to submit ourselves unto those things. In fact, maybe the one thing you could take away from today is that what is discipleship, if you were to ask that question, is simply this, 
die to yourself. Don't desire the things that you want. Desire the things that Jesus wants for you. And maybe the hardest call that Jesus ever has for us. One can't think of just denying ourselves as, as a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Like if we were raised in the church and we think of something like Lent, where we actually give up something for a certain amount of time to show our devout honor for Jesus. But rather this idea of denying ourselves is literally don't do everything you want to do follow the things that I want you to do for me. Bonhoeffer just defines self-denial in this way, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. To deny oneself is to be aware only of Christ and no more of self. To see only him who goes before and no more the road which is too hard for us. Once more, all that self-denial can say is, he leads the way, I am going to keep close to him. Good words from a man who suffered and died for his faith. Every day we must open ourselves up to God's initiatives and control. Self-denial takes shape in so many ways for us as people. For some, it may mean leaving a job. It may mean becoming his disciple. You know, if there's something unethical happening at work and you say, I can't take part in that. If I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, I can't do that. I am quitting this job today. For the proud, it may mean renouncing the desire for status and honor that you want that promotion so badly, but you know the route you have to walk in order to get to it is not the thing that Jesus would want for you. What do you do in that situation? You don't go that direction. You say, okay, if I'm going to be a disciple of yours, Jesus, I'm going to take the high road and not do those things. For the greedy, it might mean renouncing the appetite for wealth. It might mean saying, hey, I'm I'm going to give up my desire to be stable. I'm going to give up my desire to be wealthy. The complacent may have to renounce your love of ease in some way, shape, or form. I remember my wife and I were talking about getting married. She talked to me once about, about not wanting to um, follow Jesus too closely because he might call her to be a missionary, and that might mean living in like Papua New Guinea and never getting married and some of those things. You know what? As she said those things to me, I was like, I've totally had that fear before. I was like, following Jesus might mean giving up everything I've ever desired in my life. How scary can that be? But you know what? She got it. She understood that that might be the case. It might be that Jesus is calling you to something that you have to give up the things, the pleasures that you want, the desires that you have. On it goes. You would know what best hinders you from denying yourself today. You would know that thing. I imagine it's glaringly obvious to you in your life. And I imagine it's something that the Lord has been working on your heart forever. If I can say it again, die to yourself may be the most practical advice that I can give to you on discipleship. If you were to say to me, what does a disciple of Jesus do? Dies to themselves. Doesn't do the things that they always want to do, but submits everything they do unto Jesus Christ. Now, granted, sometimes those things may be the same things that Jesus wants for you and the same things that you want to do. In fact, I've found God leading me so much in my life in times of, I, I think I want to do this, and then I have confirmation along the way. And it seems like God does indeed sometimes give us the desires of our hearts, as the psalm says. But many times our hearts are desperately wicked above all things and that we're wanting things only to help ourselves and not what discipleship really means. So die to ourselves is the first piece. See, Peter, it's not enough just to say that I'm the Christ, but if you're going to say it, you better mean it. The second thing Jesus says here is to take up your cross. The cross really becomes the heart of the gospel. I don't know what the disciples were thinking at this moment. Jesus had not gone to the cross yet, if you think about this, but we know that crucifixion was pretty widely used in the ancient world as a punishment for anyone who was uh, insubordinate to the things that were going on in Rome. We today think of crosses as nice things. We have one right there, for goodness sakes. It's, It's pretty. It's nice wood. Some of us have crosses that hang around our neck, and we think they're beautiful. In the ancient world, this would have been a curse. Do you understand that? This would have been something not pretty for us to look at or have in front of our church or something like that. But as soon as they would have heard these words, they would have gone, what in the world has the guy snapped? Take up your cross. First of all, you're telling me to die to myself, and then you're telling me to take up the thing that I don't want to do, that everyone tries to avoid. Take up your cross. The bearing of a cross really becomes a central requirement of discipleship. Too often we trivialize the language of this and just think of it as something pretty. Oh, it's awesome. What a great idea to take up our cross. But when we really think about this, we know the sacrifice that it might take. 
up to this point in the Gospel of Mark, following Jesus meant free food, good healings, safety, freedom from demonic oppression. Doesn't that sound glorious? The turning point of Mark is take up your cross and follow me. Now the tables have turned. What we're going to find out is that following Jesus means othered centeredness, means a willingness to suffer for the sake of the kingdom of God. They have literally followed Jesus to save their lives, food, health, freedom. Now they're going to follow Jesus to lose their life. See, the thing is that we have to recognize that discipleship is not about just having health and wealth and being happy about all those things. It's not about just just doing good at all times, but rather in the midst of hard times, it's still saying, I I trust my Savior and Lord. I'm still going to deny myself and follow him in the midst of this, and that might mean taking up my cross. That might mean doing something very hard for the sake of the kingdom. Jesus doesn't just offer the disciples various self-fulfilling things or spiritual experiences or even intellectual stimulation. Jesus presents them with a cross. He doesn't even say, hey, try this cross on to see if you like it, to see if it fits or anything like that. He says, here's the cross. Follow me. Discipleship means that Jesus demands something from us. Further in that same book by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he says these words, the cross is laid on every Christian. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. So you want to sign up for this thing? following Jesus, being a disciple of Jesus, it's not easy, is the picture we have here. It might require something of us. It might require something we don't even like. I can't even tell you how, how many applicable illustrations I can think about for this, even in this past two weeks of our church. I mean, here I walked in the hospital room of Tom Regan, who just had brain surgery, and he said to me, well, if this is God's calling in my life, I don't want it but I hope I can make much of him in the midst of it. What beautiful words. So what are you facing right now in your life? What what piece of struggle, what crisis, what thing, if you've said to Jesus, and you've answered that question, I want to be your disciple, I want to respond to you in that way, what cross are you facing? What thing is that? Can you follow Jesus even in that? Because the implication of this whole thing is the final piece of Discipleship 101, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me is what he says. Neil Postman, in his famous Amusing Ourselves to Death, says these words, I believe I'm not mistaken in saying that Christianity is a demanding and serious religion. When it is delivered as easy and amusing, I think it's altogether another type of religion. If we don't understand the picture of discipleship, it changes our view of who Jesus is. If we don't know that that the discipleship, this question, who do you say I am, and the response that we have to that, if we don't understand this changes our view of discipleship, we've missed the question itself. Because you can say the things that Peter has, you can, you can use those words today, but you can walk out of here and do your own thing. And that's a tragedy. Because Jesus says, I have discipleship on my mind. There's a solemn warning in this as well. I don't know if you saw this, but after this whole thing, it almost puts a little bit of fear and trepidation in how we follow Jesus because Jesus warns the disciples about the judgment when he will come before them, not as the suffering servant, not as the humble one, not as even the healing person, but rather as the judge. And when he's going to come and judge the world around them for the things that they have done. It's a warning for us as his disciples if we call Jesus our Lord and Savior. But here's the interesting thing. There's a very cool promise at the end of this too. And in 9 verse 1. I'm not sure if I put those words in the screen, but it's part of this piece of the puzzle. The last verse in this section has always been kind of a puzzle where he says, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Many interpreters wonder, what does this even mean? Is he talking about the disciples are going to live for a long time and then, and then Jesus is going to come back and they're going to see him? There's been all kinds of interpretation. It's been a struggle for people to think about this. But here's the thing. I, I think Jesus is talking about something different. I think he's saying when the kingdom is going to come in power, it's the thing that you don't realize. It's the thing that I'm actually doing. Because see, here's the crazy thought. Jesus himself is a disciple in that way. He's going before the Lord. He's, he's denying himself. He's taking up his cross. And he's following the plan of God that God has for him. And what happens because of that? The kingdom of God comes with power at the cross. Jesus literally goes to the cross to give up his life for all people. And the response for us is to say, okay, Lord, you've done this. 
I deserve to give my life to you. I, I now am compelled to lay my life down, to, to self-deny as best I can, to say I'm going to die to self, to, to take up the cross, whatever that peace you have for me, the bad news of today's message, if you will, and follow you. And in this way, the kingdom of God can come in power. I think it's great to see that this is our initial step of following Jesus today. In fact, as we turn to our response time today, I would encourage you to do something. If you've never become a disciple of Jesus Christ, today is a great day to do that. Today is a day to say, okay, Lord, I, I get it now. I see that this isn't just about living the healthy, wealthy, cool life that I thought you might have for me, but rather it's about denying ourselves and taking up my cross and following you. I want to do all of those things because Jesus did it for us. He went to Jerusalem and, and indeed he died on the cross. He resurrected from the dead. And our response, our first thing to do today is thank Jesus for that. And as we sing some songs here in just a minute, I would encourage you to sing with abandon. Worship him for those things that he's done. If you have not become a follower of Jesus today, would you take that step? Say, okay, Lord, I, I get it now. I get that this is more than just this lip service, but rather I want to follow you in the things that you have for me. As we sing these songs, you're welcome to come forward and receive communion on both our tables. There's communion options. On this table here, there's a gluten-free option. You can come and you can take the bread and, and dip that in the cup and thank the Lord for the cross that he bore for you and for me. And to say to the Lord, okay, Lord, I, I want to follow you now. I don't know what that means, but I'm going to do my best to take up my cross in all the circumstances of my life and follow you. And that's the goal of today. You can give as well. There's baskets up there. We're so grateful for the gifts you've given to Imprint Church as you're part of the mission of God here at the church together. You can also pray during this time. I would encourage you to pray right where you're at. You can wander around in the building here. There's people who would be more than willing to pray for you. And maybe this is a moment where you're dealing with one of those things. Maybe you have a cross that's been laid upon you and you need to say to the people, I, I, gotta, I gotta have help going through this process. I want to bear this well and to make much of Jesus in my life. Let me close today with a final quote from Mere Christianity from C.S. Lewis. Don't try to write this down. It's too long, but I'll have it on the words behind me. He writes these words. Give up yourself, and you will find your real self. Lose your life, and you will save it. Submit to death, death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day, and death of your body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being, and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will ever really be yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself, and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ, and you will find him, and with him, everything thrown in. Let's pray together. Lord, we respond today to those words, who do you say I am? We understand that there's a question behind the question, and the answer to that is you want us to be your disciple. Lord, I pray that you would help us understand what that means. I pray that you would give us the, the, the vision and wisdom and the circumstances that we face. Lord, that as we are, uh, maybe there's people in here that are dealing with denying ourselves, trying to figure out what that means and, and to, to not just living for ourselves. Maybe there's people in here who are really bearing some sort of cross in their life. Lord, you call us to follow you in the midst of all that. Lord, I pray that you would help us do that. I, I pray that you'd help us be your disciple. Lord, this turning point in the book of Mark offers something to us, a, a reminder, an, an idea. Oh yeah, this, this is more than just lip service. I can't just come to church every Sunday and think I'm okay, but there's something more to this life. Lord, would you help us do that? Lord, would you help us follow you in the midst of whatever we're facing? God, I'm grateful for this time together in your word. May we respond to you well and worship you, for you are worthy of our worship. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.